Hi, I'm the Octopus Lady. You're watching Alien Ocean. And let's talk about whether there's a whole nother ocean underneath the Earth's crust today, shall we? So, is there? No. Thanks for watching another episode of Alien Ocean. If you'd like to support the channel, you can sign up for my Patreon over at patreon.com slash the octopus lady. Okay, so several months ago, I stumbled across an article that had this headline. Scientists discover gigantic ocean 700 kilometers beneath the Earth's surface. And I had a very visceral reaction when I read that. I was confused, excited, and a little panicky, to be honest. The panic was coming from the fact that clearly I missed a huge announcement. We discovered an entire ocean underneath the Earth's crust and I'm just hearing about this for the first time? That's embarrassing. I'm a marine biology science communicator. How did I miss this? I must be terrible at my job. But then another, more rational part of me was really confused because... How could I miss this? This feels like information that would make the internet explode. But no one was talking about it on Twitter or TikTok or YouTube. Why wasn't the internet exploding about this? And then my excitement was obviously from the possibility that there's a whole nother ocean beneath our feet. What? What would that even look like? How would a subterranean ocean even behave? Would it even have waves? Because waves are caused by wind and presumably there's no wind underground. And what kind of organisms would live in an ocean like that? Would they be even weirder than the ones that already live in ours? So I went through that whole emotional roller coaster in like 0.7 seconds before I clicked on the link and was immediately disappointed. Because of course there isn't an entire ocean beneath the Earth's crust. I just got clickbaited. And that made me mad. Way madder than I usually get when I get clickbaited. And months later, I was still so grumpy about this that I am now making a video about it because I want to actually explain what's going on with this ocean under the surface of the earth. And y'all better appreciate this because I had to delve into the science of geology to figure all this out. Okay, so a paper came out a while ago from some ne'er-do-well geologists about a diamond they received from a mine in Brazil. It didn't look this nice, it was really tiny and busted and completely worthless. Although aren't most diamonds kind of worthless because of the artificial scarcity created by the diamond industry? That's not the point of this video. Anyway, the interior of the Earth is separated into a bunch of different sections, and one of these sections is called the mantle. And this diamond came from an area of the mantle called the transition zone. I couldn't find any good scientific diagrams that showed the transition zone, so... I had to draw it myself. There it is. It's between the upper and lower mantle, about 410 to 660 kilometers down. When they were examining this diamond, they discovered that 1.5% of its weight was made up of a mineral called ringwoodite. And heads up, this isn't actually ringwoodite. This is a stock photo of a random blue mineral I found. I wasn't able to find any photos of actual ringwoodite that I could use except for this one, and it's okay. It's a fine picture. The problem is that I have to credit the photographer on screen whenever I use it, and that gets complicated complicated when I need to photoshop it into funny pictures or whatever. So I'm just going to be using photos of other random blue minerals as stand-ins for ringwoodite for the rest of the video. Okay? Okay. Anyway, where were we? Right, so this diamond had a little chunk of ringwoodite inside of it, and that ringwoodite contained a surprising amount of water. Now get a load of this. When they say water here, they don't mean, you know, water. They're not talking about two hydrogen atoms stuck to an oxygen atom. Apparently, Water, in this context, is any form of hydrogen that is incorporated into solid minerals, fluids, or melted rocks that are found deep beneath the earth. So if you were somehow hanging out in the transition zone inspecting some magma, and you found H2O molecules in it, and hydrogen gas, and methane, and hydrogen sulfide, guess what? Since all of these contain hydrogen, they're all considered water. Don't believe me? Source, right there. Do you see that? Read that. As a marine biologist, I am baffled by this. That is such a wild definition of water. Like, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just, I, it's, I, d these, these geologists, these ne'er-do-wells, they're doing this to mess with me. It all started with mantle convection, and now they're intentionally making water confusing. They're doing it on purpose. They're trying to drive me mad. Well, it's not gonna happen, you filthy rock lovers, you literal scourges of the earth. You're not gonna break me like this. Not like this. Uh, sorry about that. I just needed a minute there. Anyway, so the quote-unquote water found inside of this mineral, ringwoodite, was in the form of hydroxyl radicals, or a single hydrogen atom stuck to an oxygen atom. And when I say radical, I don't mean like 
Radical! Radicals, or they're sometimes called free radicals, are atoms or molecules that are missing a single electron. And while that doesn't sound like a big deal, it actually makes them highly unstable and potentially dangerous, especially to us weak, squishy, organic types. Free radicals play an important role in biology. There are things our bodies wouldn't be able to do if we didn't have them but they're also capable of tearing DNA to shreds. It's a whole thing, go look up radical chemistry if you want to learn more. Anyway, despite their instability, or maybe because of it, ringwoodite loves to absorb hydroxyl radicals into its crystalline structure. In fact, that little bit of ringwoodite they found inside of that diamond was about 1% water by weight. And according to a bunch of geological science and math that I don't understand, if you were to take all the rocks located in the transition zone that trapped water like this, because they don't think it's just ringwoodite that has this capability, and I guess extracted all of the hydroxyl radicals or water out of them, combine them with some hydrogen or water to make H2O, you would have an amount of actual, true, genuine, real water equivalent to what is currently in our oceans. Some articles I read said it might even be three times the amount of water currently in our oceans. I couldn't really find a solid answer to how much water is actually down there. Side note, ringwoodite is a different form of the mineral olivine, and if you've been a fan of mine for a while, you might be like, that's a name that sounds familiar, and it should! Shout out to when my friend Chemthug was in my deep sea hydrothermal vents video, talking about olivine and how it forms a special kind of hydrothermal vent called an alkaline hydrothermal vent, which might have been a necessary structure for life to develop on this very planet. Go watch our video about it if you haven't already. And then side note to the side note, when you take transparent olivine and you polish it up real nice, and you stick it in a ring or on a necklace or in the head of a sentient being who is a member of an alien species where their appearances are conscious manifestations of light, you now have a gem called Peridot. So if you're a big fan of angry little slices of pie, you can thank Olivine for that. Anyway, that's it. That's where this gigantic ocean 700 kilometers beneath the Earth's surface is. It's a bunch of fake water trapped inside of rocks. Okay, well, maybe I'm being a little mean, I guess. Because these hydroxyl radicals are sort of water adjacent. Like, they didn't spring fully formed out of the ether and then got absorbed into some ringwoodite. They came from somewhere. Okay, so I'm sure some of you have heard about the water cycle. There's water on the surface of the earth, it evaporates into the sky, it condenses into clouds, it rains back down, and the whole process it starts all over again. Well, out of the way, dweeb! Because that's nothing compared to the deep water cycle, which is either a really cool band name or a new setting on the latest model of some washing machine. We'll start the deep water cycle with a recap of everyone's favorite fundamental theory of geology, plate tectonics. So the surface of the earth is made up of a bunch of slabs of rock called plates, and they're all moving around and bumping into each other. Where two different plates interact is called a boundary, and there are three different kinds. But we don't care about these two. We only care about this one. Convergent boundaries. More specifically, subduction zones. So there are some subduction zones where heavier, denser oceanic crust slides under lighter, less dense continental crust and gets sucked down into the mantle of the earth. Now, if you couldn't tell by its name, oceanic crust is called called oceanic because there's usually, you know, an ocean on top of it. So when it's getting pulled down into the earth, water is coming with it. As the water descends into the hellish bowels of our planet, it doesn't stay as a liquid, but it doesn't stay as a gas either. If the water ends up deep enough, all that heat and pressure causes it to split into hydrogen ions and, wouldn't you know it, hydroxyl radicals, which then get absorbed into rocks like ringwoodite. Now these hydroxyl radicals are perfectly happy to stay inside the crystalline structures of ringwoodite, unless, unless they start to get pushed further and further down the transition zone. The deeper they go, the hotter and more pressurized it gets, and this causes ringwoodite to partially melt. And basically, this is an oversimplification, but basically the part of the ringwoodite that melts is the part that contains all the hydroxyl radicals. And when rocks get melted underground, you get magma. And what happens to magma? Sometimes it ends up in a volcano, and as those hydroxyl radicals start to cool down and become less pressurized, they start to react with other chemicals around them, including just plain old hydrogen, which turns them into H2O. As the magma comes spewing out at the surface, it also spews out this newly formed water, releasing it into the atmosphere as water vapor. And then that water vapor, through 
I guess the regular water cycle ends up back in the ocean and the whole cycle starts all over again. And the deep water cycle is one of the reasons we have oceans at all. If we didn't, the oceans would have been sucked into the mantle about a billion to two billion years after they first formed. Our planet would not be a water planet if we didn't have a deep water cycle. It would be just another dead chunk of rock floating out in space. And I think that's what made me so mad about this. When dumb articles like this clickbait people, most of them don't get so angry about it that they then spend a bunch of time researching the actual truth. They just get angry and then they don't want to learn anything. And that's frustrating because this is actually really cool. There's something about the deep water cycle in particular that makes the earth feel more alive. I guess? It's easy to think that everything above the crust of the Earth is separate from everything below when it's not. It's all connected to each other. Just like everything else on Earth. Nothing on this planet exists in a void. Not even rocks hundreds of kilometers down. And that's... I mean, that's really, really cool. I can't believe I just said something I learned from geology was really cool. But the point is, most people are going to walk away from articles like this having learned basically nothing. And when that happens, I think we're all a little worse off for it. But if you would like to enjoy some more not clickbaity videos, then may I introduce you to my streaming platform, Nebula. Nebula is a prestige streaming service owned and operated by all your favorite creators, like Tier Zoo, Bobby Broccoli, and me, where we make thoughtful, high-quality content that covers a wide range of topics, from politics to science to art. It's like Netflix, but for people who love trains. I personally really enjoyed Joe Scott's series, Mysteries of the Human Body, which is all about how weird human bodies can get when they get sick. If you're like me and you think humans are kinda boring, Joe's series can really help change your perspective there, because human bodies get so bizarre when unwanted bacteria and viruses show up, or when some of our DNA isn't coded quite right. Human bodies can get bizarre even when you're perfectly healthy. Right now, you can sign up for Nebula using my link, go.nebula.tv slash the octopus lady, which will get you 40% off a yearly subscription, which shakes out to about $3 a month, or you can get a lifetime subscription, which means you pay $300 once, and then you get access to Nebula from now until the end of time. As an added bonus, all Nebula subscribers can now offer guest passes to friends and family, which allows them to check out Nebula for an entire week, completely for free. No payment info is required to use a guest pass, and there are no restrictions on what your guests can watch. So head over to go.nebula.tv slash the octopus lady to sign up and check out Mysteries of the Human Body now. And with that, thanks for watching another episode of Alien Ocean. Shout out once again to ChemThug. He made me the little 3D molecules you saw in this video. He used fancy chemistry software that he has because he's, you know, a chemist, which was really nice of him. So everyone say thank you, ChemThug. Go check out the video we did together about deep sea hydrothermal vents. It's linked in the description. And also go check out his channel either here on YouTube or over on TikTok. I've linked to those as well. Also, special thanks to my patrons, some of who are scrolling by right now. I literally couldn't do this without you. If you'd like to join my Patreon and get early access to my videos or your name in the beautiful credits, you can sign up over at patreon.com slash the octopus lady. And if you'd like to see what I'm up to between videos, you can come follow me over on Blue Sky. Yeah, I think I'm done with Twitter, so we're trying Blue Sky now. We'll see how that goes. Finally, if you're still here watching this, Thank you. The YouTube algorithm really likes it when people watch to the very end of videos. It also really likes it when folks leave a like or a comment or subscribe. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And until next time, this is your friendly neighborhood octopus lady reminding you that you don't have to go into space or under the crust of the earth to find aliens. Especially since there's no actual ocean down there.